Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Chris and David. And I'd like to thank all the participants for coming here because we're going to put you to work today. Um, I'd like to start simply by stepping back and saying, why are we doing this? What is the backdrop of getting to this point? And what, what is the goal here? So many of you have heard this before, but let me reiterate. Despite the explosion of knowledge in the basic sciences, the pace of innovation in drug development, biologic in, uh, development, has been relatively f flat for 30 years. And this is in the face of massively increasing investment in both public sector and the private sector. You may not believe this, but it's well documented. <laughs> and um, recently, a couple years ago, we wrote a paper from FDA and published it on uh, truly innovative uh, products coming on the market by a variety of criteria and has been extremely flat uh, with some uptick since the biologics have really started to um, kick in. But that means that the, the return on investment, um, the productivity, however you want to call it, of this biomedical research engine that's supposed to be producing cures has not has diminished over time. In other words, there's been much more investment in, compared to the amount of output of, of the whole enterprise. And that's from the basic biomedical research all the way to the medical products on the other side. Now, the central problem that faces drug developers and biologic developers is a huge amount of uncertainty at each step of the process. Everything from um, uh, d drug discovery all the way through to the regulatory uh, process. And <clears throat> this includes tremendous uncertainty about the validity of the target. Are they developing a molecule against a target that actually is going to uh, help the disease do what they uh, expect? Uncertainty about the effects of off-target effects or the um, target effects in off-target tissues. And they're not, you know, there isn't a lot of certainty about what's going to happen, especially the more innovative you are. Frequently, there is uncertainty about how to measure the clinical effects, and we're going to talk about that a lot today, both for good and for ill. So we have a great deal of trouble um, figuring out early what the clinical effects might be. And uncertainty about um, the regulatory benefit risk at the end of the day. And so the result of this is that the well-known failure rate throughout uh, development is maintained, and that about half, a little more than half of molecules that get to phase three development, where hundreds of millions of dollars will have been um, invested, still fail. Uh, primarily, they don't have the effects that is hoped. But there's also a big chunk where there's uh, toxicity is unexpected. All right, hasn't been predicted during the clinical development program. And then there's some that just aren't as good as people hope they would be, and they're abandoned for commercial development. And then of those that go to the FDA, about three quarters or more are approved, but some never make it through that hurdle. So this enterprise, the, these problems lead to um, some of the well-known um, things that people argue about all the time in our society, right? Some of the big issues, uh, which are we don't have a lot of evidence about the drugs that we do uh, use, <laughs> right? Even through this huge investment you make, at the end of the day, you don't know a lot of the clinically relevant questions uh, when you have drugs on the market. You don't know answers to those questions. And, of course, it's very expensive to do an enterprise. No other industry faces this amount of risk and uncertainty in their development. It's an astounding amount of risk compared to the investment. And the left wing complains about the um, lack of evidence, and the right wing complains about the lack of innovation. But really, scientifically, it's all the same problem here. It's this uncertainty. Um, so... These failures occur at every step, and the goal would be to push the failures back as early as possible so that you, you can understand early what, what the probability of getting success might be. And I think what people have missed, because this debate has focused on advocacy and on 
political positions. In fact, science is what is needed to reduce the uncertainty. That's the only way we're going to reduce the uncertainty. And a lot of it is the science we're talking about here today. Like, how do you measure and predict these effects early, at the earliest possible stage? And what can you rely upon? And that science, I think, would be called translational science, the science of actually figuring out what that basic biomedical discovery actually means in, in real, in people, the relevant species. And so one area that's really critical to reducing the uncertainty is to have reliable biomarkers that you can make decisions on. There are thousands of biomarker papers published every year. Right? <laughs> and people get all kind of academic credit for that. It's terrific, right? But would you make multi-million dollar drug development decisions on these biomarker papers? Right? Would you um, make patient care decisions on them? Would you be willing to uh, trust your own safety or uh, medical care to these biomarkers that are published? Or, and would you, if you were a regulator, would you make regulatory decisions based on these uh, discoveries that are published in the literature. And I think I don't think there's much trouble answering this, these questions. The answer is no, <laughs> no, right? The people, the proponents say we should do this, the people who've published these papers, but we know a lot now about the reliability of the scientific literature, and, and basically it's just because there's a huge amount of additional work that needs to be done uh, following up on these publications. A great deal more effort has to be put in to determine the performance characteristic of any biomarker that is uh, published. And the real question is, are these new biomarkers worth assaying? Are they, is a test worth doing if you have a test? Um, do they, does the biomarker supply new actionable information? Because that's what we need at every step of the way in clinical care, in drug development, in drug discovery. We need actionable information that's reliable that allows us to make decisions and trust those decisions to be usually right. But the problem is this is not the job of the basic biomedical researcher, right? Their job is to publish papers in the medical literature, uh, in the biomedical literature. You don't, you're not going to get a Nobel Prize for um, understanding the performance characteristics of a biomarker test. That's just the truth of it. And it's also not the job of a single pharmaceutical company. Um, pharmaceutical company's primary job is to get molecules developed, right, and, and onto the market. And so figuring out, um, and that, unfortunately, this was the belief before from the pharmaceutical industry, I believe, that, and I heard it from many people, that they could develop all the science necessary to support whatever innovative area they were going into. But I think today, as we discuss this, we'll realize the magnitude of the science that's required. And you'd have to, your company would have to be devoted toward doing this, which you'd probably rapidly go out of business, right? <laughs> because uh, companies have to produce produce molecules and get uh, revenue to, to stay alive. So, um, and people, and, and um, David referred to the debates we're having in Congress over this, and the congressional staff, and they were, I think, egged on by some people who went and talked to them, believed that this FDA's job to do this, okay? But how are we magically going to produce the evidence, the scientific evidence that's required Right? We are not a research organization. Right? We are a regulatory agency. And if you look at the framework that's developed, you realize there's a great deal of science that has to be done between publication of that initial paper or those initial uh, papers around a biomarker and actually determining it's reliable for a given use. So we can't do it either. Um, so what we have and what we've had for the past 10 or 11 years is what I call consortia of the willing. <laughs> the people who've been listed on these screens who've gotten together and pulled their resources and begin to work on the science. And I think what's been so striking about this and is striking this meeting today is that we're, although there are pockets of understanding of these things, this is not a well-worked-out discipline that is extant in academia. 
right? And so we don't have a large infrastructure in place that can actually understand and perform these type of activities. And so what we've been doing primarily with the Biomarkers Consortium and the CPATH Institute and other groups who've come in is work together to develop specific measures, right? Because we weren't ready to do what we're trying to do today. Uh, so what we did was let's do some worked examples. There are a lot of people who've held up biomarkers. We should try. Many of them had been taken partway down the path. Um, more was understood about them. There were some promising biomarkers. The biomarker consortium say we've some have succeeded. Some that were held up very high, I think, have failed um, to be have predictive value. But that's a really equally important thing to know. You don't want to put your money on something that doesn't have predictive value. Um, so, um, and IMI in Europe also has begun, the European uh, government, the parliament, has put money into research, and that research is translational research, and so the IMI has begun also to work through specific examples or disease areas, like kidney disease or whatever, and try to develop a, a panel of biomarkers, and I think you're going to hear about some of that today. But all these efforts then... Um, raise the question, what methodologies and standards should be used to evaluate these biomarkers? In other words, how do you do this? How do you determine at the end of the day that a biomarker is um, reliable for any given use that you want to put it to? How do you decide that it's worth putting your money on? And <clears throat> some of the standards, like analytical validation, I think, are relatively well understood, at least within a small community. Probably, apparently, from our experience, not the broad community of biomedical research, right, but analytical validation amongst those who develop diagnostics, for example, is pretty well understood, or somebody like me who used to be an analytical chemist, I understand this pretty well, uh, how you do these things. So there's a community out there that has that expertise. Um, but others are, I would say, widely misunderstood. I think as you jump beyond analytical validation and get into figuring out what the actual performance of the biomarker, how you actually might do that is not very well understood at all. <clears throat> now that, <clears throat> So we have been working in these individual uh, biomarker development programs with the consortia over the years, um, and the history of that is... A, been, been partly laid out. We have a qualification process at FDA, which we also got. Uh, the Europeans have one, and Japan has one, and so forth. And so that's a public process whereby individuals uh, or groups or whatever consortia can come in and request that we uh, deem, you know, render a decision to deem a biomarker fit for purpose for some specific context of use. And we have been doing that over time. But the Recently, um, we have the issue of reinvigorating the evidentiary criteria has been, I think, raised, and we've been working on that um, more vigorously. So that has been a salient issue since we published the Critical Path document in 2004, okay? Because that document called for more biomarker development and use of more novel biomarkers, but immediately raised the question of how would you do that? And of course, then that immediately caused some people to say, well, FDA should just use more biomarkers <laughs> absent uh, the evidence. Uh, that's needed, because that was the misunderstanding, that if it's published, then you can just go ahead and use it, and it should be fine, okay? And <clears throat> so Chris went over all the steps that we've recently done to work again on the evidentiary criteria, starting with the CIRCE meeting uh, in August of 2015. And I think what this reflects it was very helpful to have gone through the last 10 years or so, and Martha and David, thank you very much, <laughs> because just doing those worked examples and sitting down with cross-disciplinary scientists from all different sectors, having an example in front of you and saying, what do we need to do next? 
that's been very helpful and educational for all of us to figure out, okay, how would you generalize this into standards? You know, what do you need to do? Sort of a more uh, cookbook approach. And so we had the Brookings meeting, and the best um, glossary that Chris has talked about, I think it's a wonderful tool. People should look at it. Also illustrates the problem that here in 2016, that was that when we published it, yeah, that we had to get together with NIH and we had to work through, like, what is a predictive biomarker? Right? We didn't have uh, conceptual agreement on that. Well, that's a very fundamental level of misunderstanding right? or lack of common understanding. So the BEST framework has put forth a series of definitions to see if we can't converge on some consensus definitions of sorts of biomarkers. Because as this framework document shows, you know, the, um, the amount of evidence is going to be proportional to the potential benefits and risks of using that biomarker in that context of use. And so we have to have a common vocabulary where we say this is, a, a, you know, this is for this kind of safety, this is predictive for this, and so forth, so that we all know what we're talking about. Um, the um, National Biomarker Development Alliance case studies, that also was very useful to start the process of using case studies to generalize and think about evidentiary criteria. So today's workshop really builds on this foundation. I thank everyone who's worked on the draft framework. We've seen many, co many iterations of that framework, so there's been a lot of hard work that has gone into that. Um, and then thank the people who did the worked examples because we really need to get down to concrete specifics here about what exactly do you need to do. And there's nothing like real, ex real world examples to get you to that point. I think it's hard to um, overestimate the potential impact of the work that's being done here. Um, this, in my mind, is really a new scientific field. There's no reason why this type of work isn't worthy of the kind of recognition that goes to any kind of biomedical or scientific um, endeavor. And if you look at fields that are more successful in their prediction, such as, for example, I like to use the example of airplanes. Okay, Boeing doesn't build airplanes that then fall out of the sky. 50% of the time. Right? <laughs> Civil engineers don't build skyscrapers, right, that fall down half the time, and bridges, and so forth. And the reason is they have this translational information. They don't rely on just fundamental physics or papers or whatever. They have all sorts of translational information that they can apply in building that bridge or building that airplane and use with confidence. They have models, computer models. They have uh, tolerances for various materials. They have the things they need to understand and predict successfully, okay, the achievement of their objectives. That doesn't mean they don't work through a lot of design issues early and so forth, but they are able to be successful most of the time. Um, but that means biology is a lot more complicated. I certainly realize that. But unless we have an orderly approach to the biology and we can build generalizable knowledge, we're going to continue to have this flat type of innovation curve because it's just too hard and the failure rate is too high. So you have, I think, the privilege of working here and really helping establish this new scientific field and really trying to think through version 1.0 of how are we going to set standards that can be used by everyone to, as we, as we um, evaluate molecules of different kinds and other medical interventions. So from my point of view, the charge to you all today is really engage. I've read both uh, all the different documents that were, um, you know, both the framework, worked examples. I think they're both excellent starting points. We've finally gotten down here to a level of specificity where we can really talk about how much information do you need for this in this particular instance, right? How much uh, specificity do you need? How much sensitivity do you need? How do you decide that? Um, so. My charge is engage in this. Uh, really give us all your input. 
because we do need to we need to mo- keep this moving. FDA will commit to trying to get out official FDA guidances, but I can't emphasize enough that we are just a part of this. This has to be by the scientific community and uh, owned by the scientific community. I think um, that what you do today will have real impact as a result. Uh, Unfortunately, the pace of introduction of innovation and new tools like this can be slow in as far as impact because drug development itself may take seven to ten years or more all right and so the impact of new tools that are developed through this process may have you know take some time downstream to actually be shown but if we don't do this and we continue to simply um, ad hoc use of biomarkers, uh, we will continue to have the kind of failure rates that we're dealing with, and we won't be successful in really improving innovation. And I think these societal debates about drug costs and about lack of evidence and about the standards are too low and the standards are too high, these things will continue on. Uh, so we need to offer an alternative here, which is science, okay? Let's have real translational science that can actually make a difference and an impact um, over, the, over the next several years. So I want to thank everyone who worked on development of these documents. I think they really are excellent. And I want to thank everyone who's willing to put the next two days in to really uh, make a difference in the field. Thank you very much.